right, hey folks, my name is Kimberly Unger and I'm the current mixed reality strategy holder for content here at Reality Labs. <laughs> so today I'm here to moderate a panel of developers who are bending the very edges of reality and expanding their design skills with an eye on mixed reality. Now, these are all established developers with ship titles, and they are all in varying stages of exploring MR development. And at the very end, I'm going to point you at our Mixed Reality Utility Kit. So if you don't know what we're doing, if you have not yet had a chance to play with Mixed Reality, we'll point you, we're going to put up a QR code, and you'll be off to the races. Virtual Reality has been around for a little bit. It's driving revenue for our developers. Uh, the hardware, as you've seen this week, uh, just keeps getting better. And with the launch of the MetaQuest 3, we are releasing our expanded Mixed Reality Toolkit. Now, no matter how you try to turn the lens, Mixed Reality is just getting started. Um, it's not necessarily a clear line from virtual reality to mixed reality or augmented reality to mixed reality. It's kind of its own unique thing in the middle. And you know, there are a lot of fundamental design questions that need to get answered. Um, you know, some of them are really fundamental, right? Some of them are things like, get to the next slide. Uh, you know, how do you take the design learnings from AR or from VR and use them to push your UX deeper into the real world? So you get it off your wrist, you get it off a panel in front of you. How do you, how do you embrace mixed reality in the world around you in order to drive interactions with your players? Or you have to deal with things like how does gravity work? or not work, right? When you're suddenly tied to a real world play space and you can't fudge your physics anymore to get things lined up, right? The, a lot of the things, a lot of the stuff you can do under the hood in virtual reality because you don't have to deal with the fact that there's you know, a floor or chairs, uh, you know, suddenly goes a little bit sideways. It's not a clean port um, to just bring it over. So uh, as I mentioned before, I have the privilege of bringing to the stage a handful of our developers. Um, they all have shipped titles. Um, you should know what those titles are. If you don't know what those titles are, I encourage you to go take a look. Um, and let me bring everybody up here. All right, here we go. Now I'm going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to thread the introductions through as we go along. So we'll do a few questions, we'll do some introductions, and, and everyone's got a little bit of video so they can show off what they've been working on. Um, so that'll give everybody a minute or two to showcase their work, and then we can dive right back in. And if there's questions, hold them to the end. We're going to do about 30 minutes all told, and then we'll do 15 minutes of QA uh, at the end of the talk. Um, so uh, first up, let's introduce, or rather allow me to introduce, uh, Jaime Picardo Garcia uh, from Otters Lab. Uh, Jaime, take it away. Tell us about yourself and uh, what is it you guys do? Hello, everyone. I am uh, Jaime Picardo. I'm the business director at uh, Otters Lab, basically the brainiacs behind experiences such as O Shape and Les Mills Body Combat. And I'm really excited for this discussion and to show you a video of what we've been working on. All right, shall I roll it? Yep. That's good. This is where we encourage you to really start pushing forward. If you feel it in the shoulders, feel it in the back, feel it in the abs, go! Turn it backwards, last five, four, now finish with a big one, go! All right. Thank you. There we go. All right, and so these slides are in here so you can see the question we started with. It may not be where we end, and it's just to keep me from fangirling while we're, while we're supposed to being adults up here and, uh, and, uh, and doing some paneling. So uh, question number one, if you could go back in time, what would you tell the bright-eyed and bushy-tailed younger you, uh, something you wish you'd known at the beginning of your VR MR journey? Like what's the one thing you would have told yourself uh, when you first made the jump. And uh, Jaime, we're going to start with you because we just saw your video. Yep, awesome. Um, so I think that there are many things, but definitely one of them is to make sure that you're not just translating your VR into MR, but also taking an approach where it is MR first and why does MR bring more value. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is 
one of the parts that is super important to reframe the way you're thinking and putting MR and how your environment is going to enhance the experience. And I assume that speaking into environments, there are also many other <laughs> uh, good ways to, to actually take into account where the users are in the development. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, for me, um, I've been in the XR space for about 10 years. So I think 10 years ago, I would have told myself to be patient, <laughs> just wait. <laughs> and eventually, you know, the audience will get there, the hardware will get there, the software will get there. Um, I think even more so now, I feel like I want to be developing and working with hardware that is available today and not tomorrow. So while I'm super excited for outdoor wearables and what's coming in five or 10 years, I feel like really going to where the audience is now and, and mixed reality is the perfect example of that with the new Quest 3 coming out. Um, just focusing on what can we build for players and customers today. Doug, you got an answer? Yeah, I was thinking about this a lot today. Um, I think for me, thinking about this is that uh, when I first started working in VR, the thing that I started telling myself is every idea I have, I have to cut in half because VR is so difficult, so complicated. And if you've been working in this space for a long time, you know that. And that MR is twice as difficult, twice as hard. <laughs> so if you have a great MR idea, you should cut it in half and then cut it in half again. Um, but that, like, that's where the magic is, is when you edit it all the way down and you get to the thing that only works in MR mm -hmm. and can't work in VR. That's where like, the real thing is. And do you find a lot of that, it crosses over to like flat screen develop, other kinds of, of game development, like finding that one piece of magic that can only happen on this kind of, you know, immersiveness? Yeah, for sure. So like I, I used to be a university professor and the one thing that my students, they, were, they would like yell back at me is just like, why, why, why? And I ask all the developers that I work with is like, why can I only do this in VR? <laughs> and if they tell me an answer, that I don't like, or, that, or if the answer is like, well, here's how I could do that in a flat screen game, or here's why that might be better on a TV with a controller, or why it might be better in, on a mobile device, right? But that like the, tr the, the games, the apps, the experiences that sell and that users really resonate with are things that would be impossible to do on any other platform, right? And that like ports of existing console games tend to fall really flat. Mm -hmm. generally speaking, because they're a translation of something. You have very rare exceptions of that. But, um, but with MR, I think it's another, it's another thing even further beyond that, that like you can't just port a VR game into MR. You can't, a lot of those mechanics don't translate. A lot of the language doesn't translate because they're better in VR, right? And it's really about figuring out what that thing is that is better because it's in MR, so. All right, anything to add, anybody else? No, I see a lot of nodding. Everyone's agreed. in alignment? Very much agreed. Sweet. Awesome. All right, so next up, is there anything you can share from your process, like any habit or like any one genius thing you've picked up that, uh, that you want to keep up, that you're like, okay, this works, we're going to put this into our process, and we're going to use this from here on out? And Julia, we're going to start with you this time. Great. Um, yeah, a couple of things come to mind. So definitely making sure every developer on the team has access to a headset and is looking at their work in headset every day is super critical. Um, the XR simulator tool is great for kind of mitigating against the taking on, taking off constantly throughout the day. Um, but nothing replaces the experience of actually testing and debugging with the actual device. Um, we've also gotten into the habit with build reviews of doing kind of a live stream demo. So we bring the team together, one person will put the headset on, we'll use you know, SideQuest or something to basically project with the pass-through video camera a full playthrough of the current state of the build. Mm -hmm. And it just makes it so much easier to talk through issues, bugs, you know, things that people are seeing. Um, and then the last one I'll mention is we've incorporated some LARPing into our kind of early design phase, which is really nice. fun. So we'll bring in foam swords or stuffed animals or kind of other objects and, you know, really physically block out the, the gameplay before we actually go into implementing it. Fabulous. Jaime? Yep. So uh, well, piggybacking on what uh, Doug was mentioning about cutting in half, I think that also taking into account the minimum requirements 
for the experience because we encountered that there are many, many different variables in terms of the rooms that you can have around. So having a very minimum uh, requirements for what the play space is going to be is, is super key in, in MR. And the same way that we're cutting in half, we are tripling the amount of user testing that mm -hmm. we're doing. The fact that um, you have different home offices, not trying outside for <laughs> obvious reasons, uh, but I think that that is becoming increasingly important, especially for, for MR. Fantastic. Doug? I think for us, one of the things that I've found the most helpful is uh, a, lot of, a lot of the people on our team, we have a, a pretty regular cadence of recording long playthrough videos mm -hmm. with the microphone on and doing live dictation. So, uh, so like our director of engineering, Mark Schramm, and our art director, Ashley Pinnock, who are here, make these amazing, very long videos where they're just playing through what we're working on internally and then talking about it and then our producers go back through and a lot of people on our team will go back through and we watch each other's playthroughs and we look for what we're doing when we're playing and we do the same thing with, with user testing as well and just trying to really understand each other's approach to how we're thinking about development um, and then also trying to do the same thing with users as well because like, like Jaime is saying is like being able to see it played through in different environments, how different people are experiencing it. Um, and also just like what's making people laugh? Like what are people having fun doing? Where are people getting frustrated? Um, where, where are objects getting like buried through a wall that they can no longer access, right? So. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, anything to add? No? All right. Time for our next introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce Julia Sorokoff. Uh, Julia, take it away. Hi everyone, I'm Julia. I'm a senior producer at Niantic. Uh, Niantic makes real world AR games and technology. My focus at the company is specifically on HMD games for first party and third party. Um, and unfortunately we're not announcing anything at Connect this year, but we have had the opportunity for about the last year to be working with Kimberly and her team on some of the, the new uh, MR technology that's now being made more readily available to everyone. Mm -hmm out in the audience. So I'm excited to share some early prototypes of what we've been working on and talk about our learnings from that experience. All right, shall I roll it? Yes. Fantastic. So, you know, the, the, what you guys are talking about with the, with the play testing and all those different play, play spaces and the types of uh, experiences you have to build, like how do you go about designing levels that work in a world where every living room is different or every dorm room or every bedroom is going to be a different space? And where does that thought process even start? Like how do you even get, get thinking about everything? <laughs> <laughs> Literally every possible configuration. This is the key challenge of mixed reality is you just don't know what play space you're designing for, so you have to design for all of them, essentially. Um, the scene API is super helpful for vi this very issue because it basically allows you to access the some very simple high-level um, room data that the player has given to the system. And then you can start kind of building out your scenes based on the understanding of that room data. So for example, if you want to have a scene where you have a brick wall and you need that brick wall to span maybe a 10 foot play space or a 20 foot play space, mm -hmm. this is going to help with graphic rendering. So you're not going to have all of this distortion and morphing. Um, it's going to look great in, in any possible configuration. Um, we've also come to realize that you need certain rules for occlusion. Occlusion is obviously really magical with a character disappears behind a couch, but there are some things in gameplay that you might not want to have disappear. That's absolutely essential for progression. So say you have in, in our prototypes, uh, there were a few scenes where we had these portal doorways that kind of show you what the next level or the next step in progression is. 
Um, and if those were to spawn behind an armoire or something that's in the play space, then the player would never be able to proceed forward. So there's certain things that you just have to decide, like this is never going to occlude and other things where you do want it to occlude because it's going to add a lot more kind of realism to it. Perfect. Um, and Doug, let's go to you next. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is something we started talking about pretty pretty early on in, in the project we're working on now, which is this, what I would say is like the distinction between whether or not you're designing for the actual room that the player is in, or if you're just designing for the volume of space, right? Which is like, are you designing for a cube or are you designing for a player's specific like room, right? Um, and we started talking a lot about how do we want players to feel when they're playing this this game that we've been working on that we'll be announcing sometime after Connect. Um, but we, we kept going back and like pulling in references. We were talking about like Samuel L. Jackson in Jurassic Park smoking a cigarette while he's at his computer and he's just kind of like sitting there in a chair like the most relaxed person you've ever seen trying to like solve a difficult problem. And we were like, we want users to like sit on their couch while they're playing the game. We want them to go about their room. We want them to interact with the physical objects in their home. We want them to pet their dog. And all of that happens in the context of the game. That like, we don't ignore that those things are going to happen. We try to make an experience where if those things happen, you're playing the game in the best possible way. If you're playing it in a room with a lot of complexity, but that it's also still compelling in an empty cube. Right, which is like a very hard kind of thing to access, but we've tried to embrace the narrative of the room and that like you are in your room and we're not ignoring that. We're trying to make it like a part, not just of gameplay, but of the story of the world that you're in, um, which has been very challenging, but also like when it hits and we like have seen this in some play testing where it really works and people like sit in a chair and interact with a game object and then they move a physical object from a shelf and place a game object in its place. And that's where it like really starts to work um, is when people start treating the game objects like they are real world objects, right? And that like, that doesn't work if you're just designing for like the volume. You have to like think about those things and make things that people want to treat in that way, so. Awesome. Yep. I think that they're, they're also taking a reference of something that is accessible for almost everyone, such as a plain space in almost every room you, you might mm -hmm. find one. Um, so you're able to leverage that. And the other one is portals are your friend in mm -hmm. some of the experience that you're building, whereas death is one of the biggest issues that you have in, in any small room that mm -hmm is different between uh, MR and VR. So I think that leveraging those two things to start or kick off your uh, your project is also a good starting point. Perfect. Now, uh, this is a off the cuff question. Julia, in your video, we see a you know a bunch of arrows and a, and a symbol pop up when, when you have to dodge the dragon fire. So how do you feel about player communication and sort of you know instructing them in what you need to do in an MR space? Like how do you communicate what they need in a space where half of it's theirs. Yeah, I mean, you have to teach the player. There has to be some level of fatui as people are onboarding and getting to understand the physical mechanics and gestures of how to engage with a game. Um, certainly, the UI that you were seeing in our demo is, you know, placeholder, really scrappy. Um, and the idea is you wouldn't need that over time. The player would just kind of learn those physical movements. But I think definitely early on in new spatial mediums, like new mixed reality, you do have to give the player enough tools to really feel confident and comfortable to, to engage the way the developer wants them to engage. Perfect. Doug, do you have anything to add? No? OK. Jaime? Ju no? Julia has the best answers today. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, now it is time for our oh next question. Okay, so what current challenges have you faced in VR that MR was able to solve for you? Is there anything that MR can do that you couldn't do in VR? Um, and Jaime, we'll start with yep. you this time. So I I think that there are definitely depending on on the experiences there are there are many parts that uh, MR helps a lot, which for example is body positioning mm -hmm. and the familiarity and for example balance. That is something that it allows, MR allows you to, for the player, to have a more or a better conception of their own body, where they are, mm -hmm. and what is 
a data and logs, especially in fitness, which is the um, biggest part of, of our experience, it enables certain types of exercises and movements that require the balance that MR unlocks versus VR, where it's a bit more challenging. Perfect. Julia? Yeah, I mean, I think just the freedom to move without feeling like you're going to hurt yourself <laughs> is really <laughs> nice. Um, I mean, VR, which is supposed to be fully immersive, is until you start thinking, am I about to run into a table? Or the cat. Or the or cat, the or someone else walking in, or did someone walk in and I don't know it, and they're just kind of staring at me. Um, <laughs> and you never have that friction with mixed reality. You never have to ask yourself those questions. So there is this kind of seamlessness to it um, that I think is a lot more comfortable for the player experience. And also, the player doesn't have to, you know, prepare the space. They don't have to move furniture around. They don't have to like clear out their living room. Uh, they can just very casually walk over, put the headset on, and start playing immediately. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting writing on the theory of embodiment. And Jaime, you hit on this, and I, I, this is jarring this loose in my head, which is that like, when you're designing for VR, oftentimes you're trying to convince the player that they are in someone else's body. Right, that they are a, that they are a giant robot, that they are a detective, and you can make their hands look like that. But in MR, you are always you, right? And that you are firmly grounded in not just in your body, but in a very familiar environment, and that that is an incredibly deep, deep, deep sense of immersion because the real world is incredibly immersive, right? And that like if you can pair really compelling digital objects into that space, the type of immersion that is possible, where you're immersed in an experience in a place that you already feel very rooted in, and that the graphics of the real world are amazing, right? <laughs> and that like, you've seen some of the footage from the Quest 3, like the, the color pass through on Quest 3 is awesome. Like it is very compelling. And when you can be yourself on an adventure, that's, fundamentally different from anything that's possible in VR. And it's like this really unique thing that I think, like once people start to be able to play those kinds of experiences, mm -hmm. where it's you, it's not about like escapism, it's about like this, like stepping into like a different version of yourself. Um, and I'm like, ooh, I like can't wait, <laughs> so. All right, so there's a reason I ended with you on that one. It's now time for Doug. Tell us who you are and what is up with Creature. Uh, so I'm Doug Northcook. I'm the creative director and CEO of Creature. Uh, we are a virtual and mixed reality game studio. Um, so we're working on a new mixed reality game that we'll be sharing more about at some point. Uh, but we also run a game label uh, where we support several other studios that are releasing games. Um, which is something that I've been doing for, for a few years. Um, and we work with some amazing developers who are working both on virtual and mixed reality titles. Uh, one of whom we have the honor of working with is Thomas Van Bowel, the creator of Cubism. And mm -hmm. if you were at the lightning talk earlier, you got to see an early preview of what Thomas has been working on with Laser Dance, um, which mm -hmm. we, if we can roll the video, I'm gonna talk over it because we didn't include any hype music. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but this is showing some early footage from Laser Dance, which Thomas has been working on, which is currently like my favorite thing that I've played in mixed reality because it uses the entire room volume in a way that is really impressive. And Thomas has been playing with this in Cubism for a while. And we have a short two second clip here from the game that we're working on showing some of our lighting system and effects to make real world objects feel like they're a part of the space. And then there's an obligatory dog. Um, <laughs> so. All right. Alrighty, so when you're, I mean, as we just saw, when you're building games for rooms, that's one thing, right? Different rooms. But how do you develop MR games for different people? Like, how are you guys approaching accessibility in terms of MR de design versus what you might have been doing for VR design? And Doug, you're up first. Yeah, yeah, we've been talking about this a lot. And I, I was thinking about this earlier. I was talking with Jaime about this in the, in the green room. And uh, I was thinking back to an early discussion with Mark, our lead engineer, about how we were going to do this, like how we were going to make a game that can be played in any possible room <laughs> that mm 
that can have any number of objects in it, right? It can be played in a bedroom that has dirty laundry all over the floor, or it can be played in a living room or in an office or whatever, right? And, um, but also then, like, how do you make it work for a variety of people in a variety of spaces? And one of the early discussions with Mark was, what if we took the entire room volume that we have and shrunk it down and give you a tiny diorama of the room that you're in, and we let you play the entire game as a diorama in front of you in pass-through, right? And like, we haven't finished that. <laughs> uh, and, but it's like, but that's kind of like where our thinking has been is like, in order to do this and make it something that like anyone can play, right? Regardless of their mobility, regardless of the room that they're in, or their age, or you know, their current state of ability, that people should still be able to play, right? And it's about finding new modalities for accessibility. And there's some amazing work, like if, if you are really curious about this, you should go to the session after this with uh, Ted Danola and Jasmine Kano from Alchemy Labs and Raffin from Alden talking about this like in a deep way because there's so much amazing work that's been done around accessibility in VR. But MR introduces a lot of new challenges that don't have solutions. Um, so my main thing is like, please help me. <laughs> like seriously, like this is something we're all gonna have to work on together because it's going to introduce a lot of new serious accessibility concerns that is gonna take all of us working together to solve. So if you have really interesting ideas, like I would love to hear them. Julia? Uh, thing, things that we need help with. I mean, we yeah. spent a lot of time prototyping kind of room to room transitions. One of our demos is you're essentially in like a castle or a mansion and you are in your living room, of course, but we want the player to have the impression that they're kind of moving through a much larger game board or a much larger space. And you remember early days in VR, we figured out all of the right ways to kind of treat locomotion. We did blurring and we did vignetting and we found out what's comfortable for the user. Now in MR, we kind of have to rethink all of those techniques again. Because if you're just teleporting into a different space, it's super disorienting. You have things dissolve and then respawn around you and you have no idea where you are because you weren't actually seeing where you wanted to go. And then if you're doing kind of a sliding effect where you're having that other space coming towards you, you're gonna probably feel queasy or some players will. So with that particular demo, we ended up just having a bunch of different kind of locomotion settings and testing those against different users and seeing what was comfortable. And honestly, we're still working on it. <laughs> Jaime? I think, I think that we are still in a very much learning face, mm -hmm. so that is what we're going to be finding out, but we, there are some things that we can take back from VR, so for example, in, um, in NoShip, which is a rhythm game, or uh, body combat uh, fitness app, where basically you can adapt the gameplay to things like, uh, for example, there's only upper body if you have um, options, if you have uh, problems with your legs, or there is a small room mode if you don't have a play space, so now with MR, and since you are setting up the room, mm -hmm. you can actually have the game adapt a little bit to that size of the room. So I think that that is one of the main learnings that we can stick to for now. Fantastic. All right. Um, so what's uh, what's holding you back? Like what what's missing? What have we not? I mean, the the sort of the the foundational set of MR APIs are now out. Everybody can get them. Everybody can play with them. What's the next one? What's missing? What can we break for you guys? Uh, in, in the future? I think the number one thing for us is, as we've been looking around, the biggest thing holding everyone back is that there are so few people that have been working on this. Um, and that like, I think there's an assumption that a lot of VR developers will be able to like shift over. And I think as, if you haven't already started, you mm -hmm. are going to start and you're gonna be like, wow, this is harder than I thought it would be. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think the big thing, and, and we've seen this in VR too, is the industry has grown, is that like, this is very hard work and it's not something that you can just pick up and start doing immediately. There are some people that have that kind of savant quality, um, but it really, like we need really amazing like educational resources, mentorship resources, mm -hmm. amazing documentation, sample projects, and really it's like we need other people building these kinds of things so that I can see really cool things that other people discover because we only have, there's only so many of us, we only have so much time, um, you know, and it's like the biggest thing holding it back right now is that there's just not enough of it to be able to look at yet, to know like, what the best practices are for some of these things that we've proven out in VR, so. That sounds like a call to action, all y'all. 
<laughs> yeah, let's let, let's let's get a move on. Julia, My, mine's a bit controversial, but um, in it. an ideal world, you know, where all privacy is completely protected, which is sacred, we could have access to the camera, and we would, you know, <laughs> understand on a deeper level <laughs> semantics, contextual understanding. I, I totally understand why we don't. Mm. But like we just launched an app earlier this year, Peridot, it's like a pet sim and it understands, you know, is this carpet, is it hardwood, is it grass, is it sand? If we could have that level of understanding about the environment around you, we could just do so much more to making the experience feel grounded in the real world, so. How about you, Jaime? I'll, Anything I'll, for fitness? I'll, I'll go with them, um, but definitely it's, a, it's about guidelines and best practices. I think that is the part where we're going to be getting the most value. Perfect. And perfect timing. It is now time for Q&A. Let me get forward to our fancy Q&A slide. There we go. All right. So it's going to take us just a second to set up. We have to move the cameras. We have to bring up the microphones. But if you guys have questions, we're going to have you line up in the middle. And this is like the classic Comic-Con style Q&A. You know, you can come up to the microphone, ask your question. We will answer it. Or maybe we'll just go off in an entirely different direction. That's, you know, I mean, it's a panel. Who knows what's going to happen next? Um, but we'll get that uh, we'll get that started. <laughs> All right, come on up. Uh, tell hey. us your name and then ask your question. Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Anthony with uh, Foundry Six. We also do like mixed reality games, and you guys brought up something that we deal with quite a lot as well, which is why is this in mixed reality versus VR? And I, 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 I was hoping you guys could dive deeper into that, like. I've seen a lot of demos here, and I'm still like, why is this in mixed reality? Like, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, could you guys go a bit more, one level deeper and go, like, what were some very specific things where you're like, this has to be in AR or AR provided this extra value? Thanks. That's good. Okay, who wants to go first? It's a great question. I mean, you have to be utilizing your real world, real world space in a meaningful way. Um, you know, we did a lot of prototyping with ways to kind of decorate and personalize your play space, turning it into your own sanctuary. I think there's a lot of applications that could be more kind of leaning towards creative expression that also becomes your lobby environment for then going into combat or going into you know your quest. So I think anything that's really making the location of the player matter uh, is one of the top questions you have to ask yourself if you're deciding between mixed reality and virtual reality. I think Oh, go ahead. Yep. Uh, I think one of them also is habit creation. Whenever you have a place that you have familiarity with it, specifically, for example, in, in fitness, there's people who build their habits with leaving the towel and maybe the, the, their outfit. Uh, so having a part of your home where you actually go there and, and work out and you have your surroundings, it helps you with the creation of the habit. So that's, I think, also something that players are going to be able to leverage. Done? I think the answer is most of them aren't. Like most things, most, most of the ways that people are making games now are not better if you put them in mixed reality. But there are ways of playing that are fundamentally better done in that way. Um, and I think there's some amazing examples like in development now. Like I don't know if Steven Rogers is in the room. He's working on this game called Coaster Mania where you're like building little roller coasters around your living room. Right? And it feels like playing with toys, but playing with toys in a way that is impossible with real world toys, but you can do it in your room and you can do it casually. Then you can sit on your couch and look at what you built. Right? And it's a thing that like, you could do that in VR, but it's actually probably more compelling in MR. Right? And I think the reality though is it's going to take a long time for people to find that, but also that like a lot of like flat screen video games are not better in VR. They're way better on a controller, right? Like Fortnite would be terrible in VR. Way too much locomotion, the physics are too complicated, the scale's too big, right? Um, and that's not how people wanna play, but like there are ways that people wanna play like in their home, right? But I think it's a big question, right? Like I'm not convinced that we should ever like put a shooter into MR because I don't wanna commit violence in my own home. <laughs> I'm fine to like, like send me to the moon, send me to Mars to like kill aliens, but like I don't want, I don't want an intruder in my home, right? And I think that's part of it too, right? It's like we're asking people to form memories 
in their home, in their space, and that like ideally those are like fun, positive, creative, exciting things, right? But I think it's it's a fundamentally new kind of thing. So like you're asking all the right questions, which is like why is this an MR? Um, and you should just keep asking everyone that to their face. Can I just quick follow up because um, mm -hmm. uh, someone mentioned the physicality of it, which is I think something compelling. Like, what are you? Do you guys have learnings about like AR is? It gives you access to more physicality, you know, obviously you won't run into the walls, but is there an, an additional layer there of, you know, interaction with, you, you can know, yourself? You like walk or around your, spit, your living room or your bedroom and yeah. you're not going to run into things. And you can also have your, you know, buddy creature pet who's navigating around the space with you and you're playing fetch with them or playing tricks with them and they're not going to just go through the couch. They're going to like walk around it and you can follow them around it. So yeah, it does lend itself to much more physical gameplay that's not just kind of like in an open canvas space, but actually like in your in the physical space you're in. Yeah. And I think that uh, sometimes, for example, when you're working out and uh, you wanna go hard, even though you have the guardian and you, have, you might have a reference in the virtual world as the center, it's a lot easier to actually be in your surroundings and know that you can hit really hard and you're not just gonna break the, ta uh, the, the TV, as we have seen um, everywhere. So I think that that also unlocks a new level of physicality in, in the experience. Thank you. But also, you have legs in MR, <laughs> right? Like, but again, it's like you have your whole body with you, right? Like the, the IK of the real world works, right? And so like... <laughs> Yeah, we have legs in VR now too. But we got legs everywhere, right? But like, but like everything, everything works exactly the way, right? So like, even thinking about like hand, like doing hand tracking in MR, incredibly compelling, right? Especially when you think about like like self haptics, where it's like I'm touching my own wrist to activate something, right? And that like that's so much more compelling in MR than it is in VR because it's my wrist. Right, and it's always in the right place, um, <laughs> right? And I think those are the things that, yeah, get it to work. Perfect, thanks guys. All right, next, come on up. Tell us who you are and what's your question. Hi, so I'm uh, David Monicalvo. I'm the uh, lead developer of, uh, for Virtual Go LLC. I'm the creator of the Hauntify Mixed Reality and FPS Enhanced Reality, mm -hmm. which uses pass-through for an entire full-scale pass-through experience. Um, so just kind of want to see what your thoughts are regarding like full uh, how scale applications? Well, I think Doug, you have a lot to say there. Take oh, over man. the whole house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Home scale is a really big question. I think we're like, that's the one thing where it's like, oh, we're like, we're, we're going there. We're going there for sure, right? But I think uh, I would say, <laughs> I would say to like any developer thinking about building something for like multi floor, like home scale is like, that's that's a big that's a tall order and I would start with like a single room first right because I think there's still so much to prove out in that way um, but I think when we think about like the types of gameplay like some of the early demos of that that I've seen is like have a mini golf course that goes around your whole house it's like that's a very cool idea but like getting a really compelling mini golf course just working in one room first and making that amazing um, is like, I still haven't seen that, right? So like developers who are like, I'm building a thing for the whole home, I'm like, are you though? <laughs> um, because like, show me, show, me, show me that experience working like in one space, right? But I think like, that's how we'll have to start thinking about it, especially like the vision of these devices is that it becomes something over time that you don't just put on and then take off and then put on a shelf. It's something that you have on and you actually move around your house because it starts to replace other technology, right? So it, it's inevitable, but it's also like, to me, it's still like a few steps out of reach for both like the current state of the tech, but also like I haven't seen anyone, I haven't seen anyone be able to crack mixed reality in the way that any, most of the developers in this room have cracked virtual reality yet, right? So like going full house scale is like, if you've got something like, oh man, I'm excited. So All thank right. you very much. Thank you. Okay, next question. We've got about five minutes left, so. Hi, I'm Kenneth Two of Foundry6, and my question is, is there anything that you or one of your team members thought would work well in MR, and it didn't work? And like, what are some examples of this so like, we don't do it? <laughs> <laughs> Julia, you got anything? Oh my gosh. So many things. So 
I mean, I've already kind of talked about the room to room transitions, but like thinking it would be super cool to just have another room over there, kind of like zoom into your current room feels like terrible. <laughs> and we did like a lot of different like speed tests of that and it n never felt great to anyone. Um, others feel free to jump in and I'll, I'll keep thinking on it. Yeah, so something we learned early on was that we, we started out and we tried to put a lot of objects and a lot of decorative things. We tried to put a lot into the scene. And over time, we've just been, again, cutting, 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 cutting. Um, and what we realized is that what is, at least for what we're building, what is so much more compelling is trying to think about every single thing that we put into the scene needs to be like a game unto itself, needs to be an incredibly rich object that can live alongside all of the other like physical products in my physical room, right? Because my room is filled with all these things. And if I'm asking the user to treat my virtual objects like real world objects and like place them on surfaces and interact with them when they're sitting next to a bunch of physical designed things is that like the richness in everything you put in has to be so much higher, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, if you think about like the richness of like interactions in some of Alchemy Labs games, like Job Simulator is like, you have to go even further than that because you're asking people to like, suspend their disbelief in their actual home that these things belong there, which is a really tough thing to get people to do. So we just ended up like cutting tons of stuff out and then going deeper, way deeper on individual objects. Yeah. And real quick, uh, things coming at you without a portal, very, very challenging. So that's also <laughs> something yeah, well, to know. Okay, so I thought of one more thing. We were doing some combat prototyping and we wanted to like ideally have two players in the room co-located kind of like battling each other through other, you know, characters, think spell casting kind of. And we realized that, you know, for making this work in lots of different sizes of rooms, like we actually need to kind of shrink up the footprint that two players are using. So we tried to use a portal, but we had the two players standing side by side battling each other into the portal and the UX didn't really make any sense. So, like a lot in kind of figuring out co-located gameplay and how that works too. Sorry, I didn't give you anything that will help you avoid <laughs> doing the same things we did, but just heads up, it's challenging. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, I think we have time for one more, and then um, we can do traditional hallway chat afterwards if people yeah. have more questions. Cool. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm with a game studio, and I actually have a question about multiplayer specifically. Um, if we say that. Um, MR is more complicated than VR. Multiplayer in MR is particularly more complicated. So do you have any insights to share? Um, because multiplayer can be uh, co-located in the same room, just as you said, or it can be remote. So any insights, uh, what, you know, what are your findings, early findings? Yeah, the remote was easier for us because in that example I just gave, the, yeah. the remote um, opponent was through the portal yeah. as an avatar. And that made perfect sense. It was when it was co-located, it was really challenging. And also if you're doing really physical gesture-based movement, you could really hurt someone. <laughs> so that's the other thing you have to think about with co-located multiplayer. Yeah. For the pet sim stuff, it was it's really, really special to have two people in one shared session interacting with a creature that you can both see in your mm -hmm. natural environment. So I think that kind of more casual gameplay works really well. Perfect, all right. I'm gonna cut us off here because we have one minute and 20 seconds left. Um, that's gonna conclude it. I have one super quick question for you guys. If you can pick one API beyond pass-through to include, which one is it gonna be? I mean, this is still very early, uh, but the depth API I think is like where the most it's where the biggest payoffs are going to be, mm -hmm. but it's also going to be the most challenging one to dial in to get working just right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just starting now. So check it out now. Perfect. Julia, favorite I, API? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. It's going to give you a very simplified model of the room. You can do cool volumetric effects like fog, and you can have occlusion, and definitely depth API. Nice. I have to agree. Wow, there we have it, Depth <laughs> API. Let's get it started. All right, thank you everybody. Let's have a round of applause please for our panelists who came all the way out here. Um,
If they have time, hit them up in the hallway afterwards. Um, and for those of you who are not yet dialed into our Mixed Reality APIs, go here, use your QR code, do the thing, and, uh, and get yourself started because we'll come back and check on this in again in a year. All right, thanks everybody.